now that we have covered acetylcholine, glutamate, GABA, and glycine, I want to move on to another category of neurotransmitters, which are called biogenic amines. There are five well-established biogenic amines, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, serotonin, and histamine. To cover biogenic amines, I want to focus on their synthesis pathways and then discuss some particularities they have relative to the other neurotransmitters as well as what general functions they might have. Let's begin our discussion with the first three, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Together, these three neurotransmitters form what are called the catecholamines. The name catecholamines comes from their structure, which, as you might notice, all three have what we call a catechol moiety, which is essentially a benzene ring with two alcohols. And then the amine comes from the fact that they all have an amine group that is attached to the ring. As you might suspect from the high similarity in structure, the three neurotransmitters are synthesized from a common precursor. This synthesis, which occurs at the presynaptic terminal of the neuron, uses the essential amino acid tyrosine to make the three neurotransmitters in four steps. To cover the synthesis pathway, I'll first go over each reaction individually, and then we'll come back to see the big picture. To get the synthesis going, the first step of the pathway is catalyzed by the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase, which converts tyrosine to a compound named DOPA. To do so, tyrosine hydroxylase hydrates, or in other words, HADS, a hydroxyl group here in green, on the benzene ring to form the catechol moiety. This reaction requires oxygen, as well as a compound called tetrahydrobiopterin, which will be the source of hydrogens for the hydroxyl group. The addition of OH on tyrosine causes the formation of water as well as the formation of dihydrobiopterin. To complete this picture, the oxidized form is regenerated into the reduced form by the enzyme pteridine reductase and uses NADH to do so. An important point to mention here is that tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate-limiting enzyme in this pathway, which means that the production of the neurotransmitters is highly regulated at the first step. By the way, DOPA stands for dihydroxyphenylalanine, and it is usually the L-isoform that is synthesized. In the second step, DOPA gets decarboxylated, or in other words, loses the carboxyl group here in red, and this reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme L-DOPA decarboxylase. The reaction yields dopamine and carbon dioxide. In the third step, dopamine gets hydrated, here in green, by the enzyme dopamine beta-hydroxylase, to make norepinephrine, also referred to as noradrenaline sometimes. In the fourth and final step, norepinephrine gets converted to epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, by the enzyme phenylethanolamine n methyltransferase or PNMT. This enzyme methylates, which means that it adds a carbon group, and it does so on the amine group of norepinephrine. The methyl group to make this reaction comes from S-adenosylmethionine, here shown in light blue on the sulfur, and after the loss of the methyl group, the compound now becomes S-adenosyl-L-homocysteine. In a condensed way, the pathway looks a bit like this, where on top you have the substrate names, and below the respective enzymes that catalyze each reaction. One important thing to note is that the neurons that do release either dopamine, norepinephrine, or epinephrine do not necessarily have all of the enzymes. For example, a neuron that releases dopamine will only have up to dopa decarboxylase, whereas a neuron that releases epinephrine will have up to PNMT. Alright, now that we have seen the synthesis pathway for catecholamines, let's now see how serotonin and histamine are synthesized. Starting with serotonin, Serotonin is synthesized from the essential amino acid tryptophan, and this synthesis is performed in two steps, which requires the help of two enzymes, tryptophan hydroxylase and 5-hydroxytryptophan decarboxylase. In the first step, tryptophan hydroxylase adds a hydroxyl group onto the benzene ring of tryptophan, and in the second step, 5-hydroxytryptophan decarboxylase removes the carbon dioxide group in gray to yield serotonin. As a side note, serotonin is also often referred to as 5-HT because that is the abbreviation of its molecular name, 5-hydroxytryptamine. In this short pathway, tryptophan hydroxylase is the rate-limiting enzyme. Now, for histamine, this neurotransmitter is made from the essential amino acid histidine through a decarboxylation reaction that is synthesized by histidine decarboxylase. After synthesis, 
all the biogenic amines we have considered from dopamine to histamine get transported into vesicles by the vesicular monoamine transporter or simply VMAT, which uses the proton gradient made by the VATPase. After synaptic release, the signal from these neurotransmitters is terminated by a reuptake mechanism that uses a SIM porter to create a path for neurotransmitters to return in the presynaptic body. This path is coupled to movement of sodium inside the cell. These transporters are specific for the neurotransmitter they transport, so for example, dopamine is moved by the dopamine active transporter, norepinephrine by the norepinephrine transporter, and so on. For your information, a lot of drugs target these transporters, which prevent reuptake mechanisms from properly functioning. Two good examples of such drugs are cocaine and amphetamines. Now, to complete our picture on these neurotransmitters, Let's discuss their general receptors and what general functions they mediate in the brain. I want to mention right away that a lot of the mechanisms of action of the biogenic amine receptors are mediated by G-protein-coupled pathways such as the GS, GI, and GQ pathways. So, if you need more information on these pathways, I highly recommend going back to our G-protein discussion as I cover these pathways in great detail. Alright, starting with dopamine, it turns out that when dopamine is released in the synaptic cleft, dopamine only likes to bind to metabotropic receptors. There are two main categories of dopamine receptors, the D1-like and the D2-like receptors. D1-like receptors mediate the GS pathway, and the D2 receptors mediate the GI pathway. To quickly summarize the two pathways, the GS pathway leads to the activation of adenyl cyclase, whereas the GI pathway leads to the inhibition of adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase is responsible for the production of CAMP molecules from ATP that are then used to activate PKA. The most common substrates of the catalytic subunits for PKA in neurons include voltage and ligand-gated ion channels, proteins on synaptic vesicles, certain enzymes that are involved in transmitter biosynthesis, and proteins that regulate gene transcription. Hence, you can see that the GS pathway increases kinase activity and phosphorylation, but the GI pathway decreases it. Now, in terms of where you can find dopamine in the body, the two principal areas that are associated to it are the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area, which are two regions found in the midbrain of the brainstem. Projections from the substantia nigra are most known for their involvement in the basal ganglia circuit, which mediates certain aspects of movement. Projections from the ventral tegmental area are known for their involvement in the brain's reward circuit, which mediates reward and motivation. Now, when it comes to norepinephrine and epinephrine, the two neurotransmitters also bind only to metabotropic receptors. There are two main types of these metabotropic receptors, and they are called alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. Norepinephrine and epinephrine can both bind to these receptors, so don't take the colors of these receptors as norepinephrine binds to alpha and epinephrine binds to beta. The two neurotransmitters can bind to both. One thing I'll note right now as well is that norepinephrine and epinephrine are two neurotransmitters that are highly involved in the autonomic nervous system. More precisely, they are fundamental to the sympathetic nervous system, which mediates our fight-or-flight responses. Consequently, Norepinephrine and epinephrine participate in functions like heart rate, blood flow, respiration, and so on, which are topics for which I haven't established the groundwork to properly discuss. Hence, I will name the roles for each receptor, but I won't develop too much because it is not the aim of our discussion. Nevertheless, starting with the alpha receptors, there are two subtypes, alpha-1 and alpha-2. Alpha-1 is a GQ coupled receptor and its activation activates phospholipase C, which cleaves PIP2 into IP3 and DAG to create second messengers that will activate downstream kinases such as PKC and CAMK. The downstream effects of this pathway are excitatory, and it leads to vasoconstriction, pupil dilation, and contraction of smooth muscles to name a few. On the other hand, alpha-2 is a GI-coupled receptor that is usually expressed presynaptically on norepinephrine terminals. The activation of these receptors leads to the activation of potassium channels by the dissociation of the beta and GABA subunit. Potassium channels opening causes potassium ions to leave the cell and thus causes a hyperpolarization. Since neurotransmitter release is dependent on calcium entry and calcium entry is dependent on voltage, the hyperpolarization caused by potassium channels reduces calcium entry and norepinephrine release, 
It is noteworthy to mention that alpha-2 receptors can be found in the brain and their activation causes sedation. For the beta-adrenergic receptors, there are three subtypes, beta-1 to beta-3, and all of the subtypes are coupled to the GS pathway. Activation of the receptors leads to an increase in CAMP levels caused by adenyl cyclase, and this will subsequently activate PKA. PKA activation will then lead to an increase in kinase activity and phosphorylation. Beta-1 receptors are mostly expressed in the heart. Their activation leads to an increase in heart rate, contractility, stroke volume, and atrial ventricular conduction. Beta-2 receptors are responsible for vasodilation, bronchodilation, and the relaxation of smooth muscles. Beta-3 receptors are found in adipose tissue, and their activation leads to an increase in fat catabolism. To remember their general effects, you can notice that both alpha-1 and beta-1 produce excitatory responses, whereas alpha-2 and beta-2 produce both inhibitory responses. Now, although the two neurotransmitters activate roughly the same receptors, norepinephrine and epinephrine have distinct functions due to their different expression. The main place in the brain where one can find norepinephrine neurons is in the locus ceruleus, which is located in the pons of the midbrain. Beyond what we have discussed on the sympathetic nervous system, the projections coming from the locus ceruleus are involved in sleep, wakefulness, arousal, and attention to name a few. Epinephrine neurons in the central nervous system can mostly be found in the medulla, and their projections go mainly to the thalamus and hypothalamus to regulate functions like respiration and cardiac function. Moving on to serotonin, there are seven known families of serotonin receptors that can be found in the body, and six of them are metabotropic. Out of all the biogenic amines, serotonin is the only one to be known to activate a ionotropic receptor named 5-HT3. This type of ionotropic receptor is very similar to acetylcholine receptors in the sense that it is a pentamer and that upon opening, it is permeable to cations. Hence, this receptor has a reversal potential near 0 mV and causes excitatory postsynaptic potentials, or in other words, depolarizations. When it comes to the metabotropic receptors, the six different families mediate the GS, GI, and GQ pathways. The receptors 5-HT1 and 5-HT5 mediate the GI pathway, whereas the receptors 5-HT4, 5-HT6, and 5-HT7 mediate the GS pathway. Finally, the 5-HT2 receptors mediate the GQ pathway. These pathways are the exact same as we have seen previously. The main region in the brain where serotonin neurons can be found is located in a structure named the RAFE nuclei, and serotonin is implicated in a wide diversity of functions like wakefulness, motor behaviors, emotions, and hunger. It is noteworthy to mention that serotonin also has some projections to the spinal cord to modulate sensory, motor, and autonomic functions. Finally, when it comes to histamine, all of its known receptors are metabotropic. There are four main families, and just like in the case of serotonin, these metabotropic receptors carry out the GI, GS, and GQ pathways. Receptor H1 mediates GQ, H2 mediates GS, and H3, H4 mediate GI. In terms of its location in the brain, histamine is mostly found in neurons of the hypothalamus, and their connections mediate wakefulness and attention. In summary, of what we've discussed about biogenic amines regarding the receptors and functions, you can refer to this to get a general overview. Alright, with biogenic amines now covered, let's move on to the next type of neurotransmitter I want to cover. This class of neurotransmitters is referred to as the purines, and it includes adenosine triphosphate, more commonly referred to as ATP, and adenosine, which is the degradation product of ATP, or in other words, ATP, without its three phosphates. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.